Okay. Let me check to make sure I'm recording to the cloud. I think I am. Okay. All right. Welcome to today's session of Open Texas 2022. I'm Lisa Lewis with the Open Texas Conference Committee, and I will be emceeing this session. Thank you all for joining us today for Open Music Theory Version 2, a multi-institutional model for developing open online textbooks. And now I'll turn it over to the presenters. Thank you so much, Lisa. And let me get my screen share up and we can get started. Great. Good morning or afternoon, depending on what time zone you all are in. Um, I'm Dr. Kyle Gullings from the University of Texas at Tyler, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Dr. Chelsea Hamm from Christopher Newport University in Virginia. Today, we hope to provide you all with a practical model for how teams of authors across multiple institutions can collaboratively write a useful and sustainable online textbook. Uh, by the end of this presentation, we hope you will be able to do the following, to articulate a coherent model for assembling a multi-institutional team of authors seeking funding and dividing the labor of a large open educational resource project. Number two, be able to demonstrate a familiarity with a variety of online format, uh, sorry, online platforms and software that enable efficient collaboration and project management among authors of open educational resources. And finally, number three, we hope you'll be able to detail the benefits of a multi-institutional approach to authoring these open educational resources. To help frame our discussion, we will take as our case study Open Music Theory Version 2, a natively online open educational resource intended to serve as the primary text and workbook uh, for undergraduate music theory curricula. Authored by uh, seven faculty, uh, including Dr. Ham and myself, uh, each from different institutions, including the University of Texas at Tyler, and the University of Texas at El Paso, since this is Open Texas 2022. Open Music Theory version two was supported primarily by a course redesign grant from Virginia's Academic Library Consortium, or VIVA. The resource is intended, sorry, it is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 international license. Through the lens of our experience authoring OMT2, we will uh, talk you through key elements of our process, including assembling your team, seeking and spending grant funds, the division of labor, including some processes and tools that we used, a specific uh, online set of platforms and software that we used, an overview of what we see as the benefits and some challenges of doing this in a multi-institutional collaboration, and the role of university campuses in supporting these so sorts of projects. Uh, we'll finish with a live tour of the resource. Uh, and of course, that is a lot of ground to cover. So some topics we will be discussing in a somewhat cursory fashion. If you have any thoughts or questions while we're talking, again, we do invite you to put those in the chat for us. And we'll also leave uh, probably about 10 minutes at the end of our presentation and tour for questions and group discussion. The first step in embarking on a multi-institutional textbook project is to assemble a team of authors. One obvious way to do this is through leveraging existing professional networks of contacts to seek potential collaborators who share a commitment to the value of access to open educational resources. Five of our seven authors for this project received either their master's or doctoral degrees in music theory from Florida State University. So there, of course, is a built-in professional relationship there, as well as exposure to a common theoretical framework and language from which to approach the field and bring some unity to the project. Further, our uh, eventual funding source, which we will discuss in more detail later, has a specific mission of decreasing the cost of higher education in the state of Virginia. So this was a natural fit, of course, for the three team members 
who were co-authors who were teaching at universities in Virginia. The two odd folks out in our group were Dr. Mark Gotham, uh, our resident composer, music theorist, computational music theory, pedagogy researcher, and computer scientist, uh, and myself, a composer with, frankly, no graduate degrees in music theory, but who has been using uh, open music theory version one for a few years in my classroom at this point, and had authored a peer-reviewed collection of over 100 worksheets, exams, and other course materials for use with that original version of the online textbook. Um, I had published that collection of worksheets under a Creative Commons attribution share alike license through the free online Journal of Music Theory Pedagogy, which is, I think, the first place some of the team members found out about me and got me attached to the project. Um, a little over one year later, in November of 2018, I attended the annual conference for the Society for Music Theory in San Antonio. Um, uh, just a few hours down the road, if you're in Texas, um, uh, where where I met and spoke with a few of the lead organizers of that nascent project. This was, a, as a composer, this was actually my first time at a Society for Music Theory conference. And I just went to hear people talk and to talk about my resources. So I expressed to them my interest in adding my worksheets. And a couple of months later, in January of 2019, um, all of us received an email organizing um, the project around a forthcoming uh, grant application. To me, this story really highlights the importance of continued professional networking through one's career by means of active publications and active conference attendance. In reality, the scope and nature of our particular project far exceeded uh, the individual efforts of the seven primary authors. When all was said and done, the resource really benefited from 21 additional contributors filling various roles of author, editor, typesetter of musical examples and worksheets, research assistant, and much more. Not to mention our visual artist who designed our cover art and logo. Some of these were grant-funded student worker positions, while others were volunteers. So when I speak of our OMT2 team, Although I often mean just my co-authors and I, due to the sheer number of hours the seven of us devoted to the project, uh, it is also worth mentioning that we comprise only one quarter of the individuals involved in the labor of bringing this resource to the public. It was not just a handful of us. You've heard me already mention grant funding earlier. While not a prerequisite to authoring an excellent textbook or other open educational resources, uh, there are certainly benefits to securing funding for a project like this. So this is an avenue at least worth exploring if you are in the early stages of writing your own collaborative project. Grant funding can be sought uh, through, um, through individual academic institutions, through university systems, through state higher education boards or councils, through professional organizations, and also through other outside entities. Our presentation today, by the way, is not at all meant to be a workshop on how to secure grant funding. I would by no means consider myself an expert on that topic, um, but here is our experience in a nutshell. After some time of pondering the need for this sort of textbook and garnering interest, as I just described, through conversations at that Society for Music Theory conference and elsewhere, our project lead, Dr. Meg Megan Levengood of George Mason University in Virginia, discovered a course redesign grant opportunity being offered through VIVA, which you see on your screen here, Virginia's Academic Library Consortium. VIVA is funded by the Virginia General Assembly, which if you don't know is the state legislature for Virginia, and the VIVA member institutions. Um, and it is also sponsored by the State Council of Higher Education. Organized and spearheaded by Dr. Lavengood, we collaboratively wrote a grant application titled A New Vision for Open Music Theory. That application was 12 pages long, not including supplementary data and attachments, and it included the following sections, biographical information on each of the authors, the type and size of grant we were seeking, information on the courses projected that we would be impacting, 
the existing proprietary resources that we were seeking to replace and how much those cost, therefore the calculated savings, uh, and a very extensive narrative section, and institutional and external letters of support. That's what went into this grant application. That narrative section, number six there, I mentioned is, is rather extensive. In fact, it's about 85% of the grant application. Um, and so let's talk about some of the components that went into that narrative. It consisted of the following, project goals, a statement of transformation, which itself included uh, an introduction and overview of the project we were proposing, as well as some projected near-term and long-term impacts of this project. A transformation action plan, where we detailed our division of labor, who would do what. Uh, we gave some qualitative, quantitative and qualitative measures of success that we would outline for our project. Gave a timeline, a budget, and finally a sustainability plan. I go through all of this, not because it's unique to our particular grant application, but because if you aren't very experienced with putting in grant applications, it might be nice to see the various things we had to, to put forth in order to secure this funding. This application was due on January 31st of 2019. And then on March 1st of the same year, we received notification. We had been awarded this grant in the maximum amount allowable of $30,000. We were happy about that. So here's a breakdown of how those funds were allocated in our original budget. The compensation for each primary author was helpful in incentivizing at least a small portion of the time that each of us put into the project. But more than that, I'll add that it helped ensure buy-in and commitment from a group of geographically dispersed team members during what ultimately became a multiple year uh, process. Uh, beyond that largest budget item, the remaining funding allowed our team to accomplish several things we otherwise couldn't have as a group of volunteers, um, which was kind of surprising to me at the beginning. I thought, well, why do we need funding to make this happen? It's a free book. We're just going to write it. But there's a lot of things that that um, I had overlooked before we got this grant. Um, one included this. Uh, we hired a team of student workers to transcribe homework sheets and in-text examples into the free Muse score music notation format. Um, that's something that all of us team members were capable of doing, but there was just so much of it to do that having paid student workers and compensating their time uh, proved vital. Uh, and because we renotated these in this free music notation format of Muse score, we were able to ensure that future teachers and students using our text could download and edit most of the musical examples in our textbook or in our worksheets um, to suit their own needs without requiring the purchase of costly proprietary music notation software. So this is an access issue. And this decision allowed us to strengthen the impact we'd have with our attribution share alike license for our resource. We also set aside funds to pay copyright fees to allow the inclusion of copyrighted audio and visual excerpts in our online text. Now, this is, of course, a standard expense of most textbook publishing, whether it's online or uh, print publishing. And uh, we authors likely would not have ponied up those $3,000 ourselves to get the best examples that we wanted from the literature included. So we probably couldn't have self-funded that. Um, we also dedicated funds to activities meant to publicize and popularize this uh, new resource. These included publication fees meant to cover, um, as I said, the inclusion of copyrighted excerpts, not only in the textbook, but also in any future scholarly publications that we, we may seek to put out as authors about our project. We wanted to be able to cover those publication fees, as well as travel costs for the authors themselves to attend professional conferences like this one and present on the project. Um, we supported also the stability of our project longer term by purchasing several years of domain name registration for the name of the website for that textbook. Again, um, things that were, I felt, important, some of which had very real hard costs that this grant allowed us to do. Of course, since presentation travel costs were curtailed due to COVID restrictions, we found ourselves with some leftover funds, and these primarily went toward hiring a professional editor 
to edit the entire text front to back for coherence and consistency in its language, as well as accuracy, plus a professional graphic designer who created a new cover and logo that I really love, and you'll get to see in a little bit. Um, flexibility in how these funds were allowed to be allocated was an added bonus of our particular grant, though not necessarily true for every grant you might seek. When taken together, these various line items uh, in the budget helped us to create a resource that had greater quality, impact, appeal, widespread use, and longevity than it would have without the funding that we secured. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, as with any collaborative venture, a successful multi-author OER project requires a proactive and flexible approach uh, to the division of labor. We divided our chapters based upon both author interest and research expertise. For example, several authors were already experts in popular music, and consequently, it made the most sense for them to author a new section on that topic. Conveniently, it was fairly easy for us to divide up the topics as our authors' areas of interest and expertise were very diverse to begin with. For uh, those looking to undertake a new OER project, aiming for a diversity of author research areas would be an excellent goal. In our OER project, different authors wrote large sections of the book, each of which uh, contained many chapters. And you can see these large sections on the screen there. Authors were completely autonomous within their large sections and we trusted each other to be content area experts. It goes without saying that such trust and autonomy would be vital to the success of any large scale textbook project such as this. That being said, having a project lead who is to some extent the boss of the project is also very useful. For example, our project lead was the organizer of author meetings, but she also served as the contact person for the vendors, editors, and the student workers. Project organizers should not overlook the importance of creating internal style guides, page or worksheet templates, and other measures of standardization and uniformity early in the process. Such style guides can often be borrowed from peer reviewed journals or academic presses, meaning that they do not necessarily have to be undertaken from scratch. As mentioned earlier, a remunerated line editor can also be incredibly helpful uh, regarding issues of standardization and uniformity. With seven authors working on a total of 112 chapters, this has been crucial in bringing coherence and consistency to the writing style, grammar, terminology, tone, complexity, and pedagogical approach. There is one additional point we would like to make before discussing our various online platforms and tools. Uh, it is easy to underestimate the amount of work that a textbook project such as this one can generate. Uh, for example, I thought that authoring the music fundamentals section of our textbook would take about six months tops. My reasoning was that the topics were simple, so explaining them would be simple as well. But in some total, it took me almost two and a half years to complete this section, and I'm really still working on revisions and edits to this day. In terms of worksheet creation, uh, what Kyle did, the process was also much more time and labor intensive than he originally envisioned. There are roughly 300 pages of the workbook, which cover our 112 chapters. Several chapters have multiple assignments, while others do not. Our solution involved chapter authors also consulting, co-authoring, or even authoring many of the worksheets for their respective chapters. In some instances, such as in the music fundamentals section, whose content is the most simple, university students were employed to design typeset and even to create answer keys. We started using uh, Oops, sorry, we started the Open Music Theory Project um, before COVID. This means that many of us learned to use Zoom for the first time uh, for this project, for OMT, which proved to be very useful later during pandemic online teaching. 
We chose Zoom as our virtual video platform simply because several authors had university subscriptions to the service, which was uh, were paid for by their respective institutions. However, organizing live meetings between seven authors and across several different time zones was challenging. We used many other platforms to communicate with one another on everyday topics as we were doing our best to avoid email whenever possible. Slack, a free app, was our platform of choice for text messages. And you can see a screenshot of our most recent Slack uh, over there. So on Slack, we could have categories for message topics, which helped us to stay organized. For example, some of our individual sections were Slack topics, such as music fundamentals, the workbook, or post-total analysis, but we also had categories dedicated to style and formatting or completed chapters. Slack also allows one to message individually directly with other members of your team and lets you reply uh, back and forth to specific messages and threads, which helps with keeping track of different topics uh, when you're talking to multiple people simultaneously about a lot of different things. We stored files online in a shared Google Drive folder for which everyone was an editor. Within this shared Google Drive, we had several spreadsheets also to help us keep track of individual tasks. For example, we had a spreadsheet for worksheets that needed to be created, for musical examples that needed to be typeset, for tasks that student workers should complete and of copyright permissions. And you can see one example of those. I think that's the examples one on screen. Having one spreadsheet for each type of information made it easier to stay organized. Although even with all those spreadsheets, it could be overwhelming just by the sheer volume of information that we were attempting to keep track of. Several of the authors also utilized Trello to help us keep track of all the things we needed to do when writing a chapter from scratch. And you can see a screenshot of that. Trello offers a checkbox system for tax, tasks, which closely resembles my in-person system of using post-it notes. Uh, it's no surprise to me, therefore, that I was the author who most utilized this free online tool. Um, and so each one of these little, um, boxes you see, you could open it and then it would have a list of like 10 things that you could check off for your chapter. Uh, in the end, some of the authors of OMT used Trello and others did not. It really was not as vital as Slack, virtual spreadsheets, or the Google Drive for our day-to-day -day communication. The platform that we utilized to create the textbook was called Pressbooks. Um, this was not our choice. It uh, was actually the platform which was provided by the grant, and using it was a requirement of our funding. The interface, however, was fairly intuitive, and uh, but it did require becoming at least somewhat familiar with HTML coding, as well as with Unicode and LaTeX, the latter two of which help us to typeset all the special musical characters that we needed. Um, learning even the basics of these was not an easy part of the project for me. Um, my other teammates were more familiar with coding, and consequently, I needed more help than some of my peers, or perhaps I just felt that way. I learned from YouTube videos, from websites, and from my student workers, who were sometimes paid to literally troubleshoot shoot coding problems I was having. When all else failed, I contacted our team lead on Slack, and Megan is an expert coder conveniently, which worked out well for me. Within our online platform, however, we ran into many, many problems. Uh, our team lead had to communicate with the platform support team on numerous occasions on issues ranging from fonts to embedding permissions. Our first issue was how to show and play musical examples. Um, and we ended up uh, using MuseScore, you can see a screenshot of that on screen, um, to, to typeset uh, musical examples and these scroll through and play in the chapters. As with many of our decisions, cost played a crucial factor. So we utilized MuseScore for music notation because it was free. And then we also utilized Spotify to play uh, music recordings, again, because of uh, its free nature. Um, so that we used to make playlists and uh, both for chapter playlists or for, for homework playlists.
Oh, Kyle, I think you might be still on mute. Thanks, Chelsea. I was. Now that we've outlined some of the processes and tools that we've used to collaboratively author our online textbook, we thought it would be helpful to detail what we see as some of the benefits, as well as a few challenges specific to our multi-institutional approach. First, since we had the input of seven professionals in our field, we can have increased confidence uh, that our text is accurate, comprehensive, and using the most widely accepted and up-to-date terminology and theoretical approaches in our field. Of course, a similar collegial verification also normally occurs through the peer review stage of traditional textbook publishing, a step that we have considered pursuing as well. But our project benefited from having those frequent discussions and interchanges with uh, multiple expert voices early on and throughout our writing process, as opposed to just at the end when we make suggestions of uh, what to change. We also benefited from an increased diversity of topics and pedag pedagogical approaches. For example, uh, as uh, Dr. Ham already mentioned, some members of our team specialize in specifically in the theory of popular style music or others 18th century musical form and analysis, and yet others 20th or 21st century techniques and atonal music. Um, as a result of how many different expert authors we included at different institutions, the range and depth of topics we were able to cover were likely greater than any one or two of us authors could have achieved in isolation. Of course, this would be true of any textbook that has multiple authors, and not only those that are at different geographic locations or multiple institutions. Our multi-institutional approach certainly did lead to an increased impact on equity, access, and student savings, which I think was the most important thing for Viva as the granting organization. Um, because all of the faculty involved were teaching at separate different universities, we were able to immediately reach several discrete student populations. In aggregate, we projected that we would save 1,269 individual students nearly $254,000 combined in our first year implementing this textbook in our classes. And that's an average of just over $200 per student. That savings coming primarily from what is the cost of each different school's proprietary textbook they had been using. Now, in terms of usage, we implemented analytics on our site in November of 2021. And over the next nine months leading up to this past month of August 22, uh, we had over 231,000 unique visitors and over 376,000 page views to Open Music Theory version two. That is a little bit of a stand-in for the real question, how many people are using this text instead of a proprietary text in their classrooms? But it's at least a, a good start of some metrics we can use to check on the impact. And because we were at a bunch of different schools, we could assign this free text to all of our different student populations. Um, thinking beyond these financial and use metrics, each of us has also leveraged our own unique set of contacts and scholarly activities to bring greater awareness to our new resource to a wider professional network. This is leading, at least we hope so, to even more adoptions and influence in the future than we could accomplish if this were a solo or a small group effort or one centered in a single institution or geographic region. Um, this scholarly presentation you're attending right now, of course, marks our group's ninth so far scholarly output stemming from this project and helping publicize it. Um, despite the benefits of working on a dispersed team like this, this format was not without its challenges. As a small example, rather than one grant office facilitating all of our finances, we had to navigate six separate university research grant offices, each with their own staff, with their own timelines, their own rules, set of rules and procedures for distributing and spending funds, some of which were widely different from each other. And so of course this led to delays some cases, many, many months of delays of payments on stipends, as well as more seriously, a 
narrow and shifting window of work eligibility for our student workers. They can't just work whenever they want to. They have to be hired on for this grant, and that takes time. Um, even before COVID was had made this practice widespread, our team held all of its synchronous meetings over Zoom. Of course, this meant that none of us could simply stop into a colleague's office down the hall to ask a quick question about how we describe minor scales. Um, the result was a lot of solitary work punctuated by full group project update meetings, check-ins, discussions, many of which happened, as Dr. Ham said, over Slack or elsewhere. Um, as already mentioned, though, one silver lining to this remote work was that it forced all of us to become very familiar with Zoom uh, video conferencing in 2019. Really good timing, if you ask me, because this was less than one year before COVID made Zoom or other similar tools mandatory. Speaking personally, I had never used Zoom video conferencing um, before this OER project. It was my first time on Zoom. And my fluency in Zoom as a result of these meetings was the only thing, in my view, that allowed me to have even a partially salvaged spring 2020 teaching semester in my music theory classes. All in all, I do feel very fortunate to have been part of this large multi-institutional collaborative team, because again, I keep saying this, I think we accomplished far more together than any of us could have done alone. Before we close and move to our live tour of the text and your questions and discussion, I want to take just a few minutes to reflect on the important role that university campuses can play in supporting multi-institutional open educational resource projects like ours. Many institutions and university systems now have recurring internal grant programs to develop new OER or to adapt or adopt existing materials uh, into their courses. So those of you on campus who set policies for or administer such ventures, I think would do well to include language in your policy that is friendly toward or even encouraging of proposals involving multiple authors from multiple institutions. The same goes for institutional grant or research offices whose staff could actively monitor and distribute information to faculty about external funding programs for the development of open course materials, much like they normally do for traditional research funding grant opportunities. Institutions should also work to establish robust and specific tenure and promotion policies that overtly support and develop, um, sorry, overtly support the development of teaching materials more broadly and open educational resources in particular. While some institutions have taken this important step, many have not. For example, I am currently planning to apply for promotion to full professor in fall of 2023, yikes. And because there is no explicit mention of either teaching materials or OER in my own campus's T&P guidelines, I'm not sure how the four and a half years that uh, I will have spent on this project will be viewed by my department or other internal or external reviewers when it times, comes time to apply, or honestly, whether this venture will be given any weight at all. You heard, the, heard me mention earlier that I got attached to this project primarily because I was using version one and had written over a hundred worksheets. That took a lot of time and that was pre-tenure for a lot of that. And so the hundreds of hours I devoted during my assistant professor time to adopting version one and authoring these worksheets were actually not mentioned in any way by any level of review uh, of my, my own tenure and promotion dossier when I first went up, um, especially for early career academics on the, on the tenure track who are acutely aware of the mantra, publish or perish, a campus that sets and enforces clear parameters in the evaluation of faculty authored teaching materials and OER in particular within the tenure and promotion process has already gone a long way toward incentivizing its faculty to take on such worthy and worthwhile yet time-consuming projects. In summary, um, referencing our own experiences authoring Open Music Theory version two, Dr. Ham and I have attempted to outline a coherent model for other authors to follow in the development of open education resources, open online textbooks, particularly when involving faculty from multiple institutions. We walked you through how you can assemble your own team, seek funding, divide the labor up, 
to discover and utilize efficient processes and tools to author the work and manage your workflow and maximize the impact of your project. So whether you are a faculty member, a student, a scholarly communications professional, uh, a library director, university administrator, or someone working at a state agency or external organization connected to higher ed, we hope you found something of value in our presentation and that you will continue your work to better align your own institution's financial and human resources in and its policies in support of the development of open educational resources, particularly those being authored by a small village spread across multiple institutions. I want to take just a moment to send a big thank you to all of our co-authors of Open Music Theory version two, who've we've, who we've listed on this slide. Uh, if we have time, uh, Dr. Ham will now take us on a brief tour of this online textbook so you can see its scope and how it's put together, after which we'd be happy to see what has been going on in the chat, answer any questions, and have some discussion. So I don't know where we, if we want to quick check the time and how much time we have left. Yeah, I think we got um, a couple minutes. Magical. Great. Let me just go ahead and share this and hopefully, can you all see that? Yeah, yes. magical. So here um, is the, the cover of the book. And so we can go to read book. That's our graphic design that <laughs> Kyle really likes. I love it too. Um, we over here have uh, our different big sections. So uh, if you expand these, you can see each of these is an individual chapter. Um, so for example, let's, let's check one now. How about uh, simple meters? Everyone, everyone likes rhythm. So uh, we have um, this feature, we have clickable glossary terms. So you can see uh, just the definitions of words right away. That's been very useful for students. We have chapter playlists. Um, that's what I was talking about in terms of uh, Spotify. Hopefully the internet's working good today. Uh, yeah, so there's an example of a, of a chapter playlist. Um, sometimes we embed videos or our uh, music right uh, inside the chapter and students can play those. Um, that's really nice uh, for students, diversity of examples here. Uh, we have regular graphics. Um, we have some videos we made ourselves. Um, let's see, nice examples. Um, here's what I was talking about with MuseScore. Uh, if I play this, it'll just scroll along. And that's just an example of that. We have many of those. Uh, some are annotated. Uh, that took us a while to figure out how to do. Um, yeah, gosh, that goes on for a while. Oh, this is a long one. <laughs> what do you know? Uh, down at the bottom, we always try to link to high quality uh, online resources. So the students who are having trouble with the topic uh, can, can check out more about it. Um, there's uh, assignments from the internet also linked. Um, so uh, instructors can easily get high quality resources that have been vetted. And then of course our own assignments uh, that Kyle mostly authored uh, down here and media attributions as well. And it looks like we're at our question time. Yeah. Um, yeah, before we start questions, um, Lisa, would you remind me when we're ending? Are we ending right at noon today? We end right at noon. Yes, that's correct. Perfect. Awesome. And I believe you've addressed the question that was posed in the general chat already. Um, this is a good opportunity for anyone else to ask any questions you might have at this point. Yes. Um, Hope everyone can still hear me. Uh, yes, indeed. We we uh, maybe for anyone who wasn't checking the chat, uh, Mandy had asked earlier about how um, how the budget allocation was was broken down and how we decided who decided how much should be sent to each portion. And yes, that was um, our 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 team of authors proposed that in the proposal. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Jeff, I think you had your hand up. Yeah, um, so I was wondering about uh, other professors in the discipline. Have you encountered any resistance to having this text? I know that a lot of music theory folks tend to stick to the textbook that they love. Um, has it, have people been like, oh no, but it's not this one, therefore I won't use it, that kind of thing? So, this is a kind of a tough question to answer just because um, we haven't had a conference in the last two years. So the uh -huh. last time I saw most of my field was in November 28, 
18, yeah, 2019. Wow. 19. Uh, it, it's been a couple of years. So we're, we're meeting this fall. So it's hard to get like a, a large scale s- sense of like, um, like I would say like how my colleagues like, like feel about it. Um, that, that said, um, uh, we do get lots of emails of people adapting the book. Uh, it does seem to be widely adapted. Um, and uh, we, we get everything from like typos to, um, you know, we like this to, oh, can you add this? Um, stuff like that. So I don't really know. <laughs> Sorry. No, that makes sense though. Thanks so much. Yeah, I guess we'll find out in two months uh, how people like it. I, I will add that one of the nine scholarly presentations some team member or members has given was that all of us presented at Society for Music Theory. Was it one year ago, Dr. Ham? Uh, maybe one or two. I, I think, think it was, it was one. 2020. Yeah. Okay, so maybe two years ago, um, a, a virtual presentation in, at a virtual online conference. So of course, the people that came to that room were much like today, the people that want to learn about it and that are maybe open and receptive. We didn't have anyone uh, Zoom bomb us saying this this resource is trash and you shouldn't do it. Um, but uh, we'll see what it looks like in November. <laughs> yeah, and we have thought, thought about, um, you know, there might be some resistance among people who are still publishing, you know, paid resources. Um, sure. But we haven't there's, run into them. <laughs> there's a new question in the chat from Mandy um, asking if you can talk about how you all found each other and decided to work together. Mm-hmm. Be- because there are seven of us, I think there's seven different answers to that. There were a couple of folks who had been tossing this idea around for a few years before I met any of them. Um, and so I can't exactly speak to them, but again, my my role as the workbook homework sheets author um, or coordinator maybe was was a little unique, I think, compared to some of my other colleagues. I'm Again, I, I'll, I'll raise my hand and say, I'm the only person on this team who doesn't have a PhD in music theory. Um, and so, although I understand the fundamental stuff pretty easily, there was some there were some worksheets where I just said, you're gonna need to design that for me because I don't know anything about rotational arrays. Um, but, okay, I'm a composer. I know a little about that. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I would say a combination of that grad school um, colleague, network that five of the seven of us shared, as well as um, conversations and presentations at uh, at SMT at the conference. Um, and, and Chelsea, you, you said something the other day, we were talking about the geographic proximity as well. Yeah, I, I think, um, frankly, I got edited on, I presented with Megan, the project lead at SMT 2018. So I think I might've been on her mind. And then uh, the grant was for Virginia and I teach in Virginia. So, I, I mean, I, I don't know for sure, but my best guess is, you know, the early, uh, the earliest people who were in on it, which were Megan and, and Bryn, were probably like, who else can we get from Virginia, <laughs> frankly, um, to, to strengthen uh, the, the grant proposal. And it ended up being three of us. Um, and really it was just the three of us who, who knew each other. Yeah, I'm we ended s- up with... Three, sorry, we ended up with three from Virginia, two from Texas, one from Canada. Sorry, I don't know the province. I want to say Saskatchewan. And then one sort of from Cornell, but sometimes from the UK and sometimes from Germany. Um, <laughs> so we were a little little dispersed. I apologize for interrupting. I, I was just going to say I did also get a question myself during the presentation about access to recordings, and that was not addressed in the in the uh, moderator script that I had been provided. So I did ask about that. Um, recordings are going to be available um, almost fairly soon after the presentations themselves. In fact, this morning's keynote is already up. And if you're not aware of how to get to those recordings, you can go to the Open Texas site um, and where where you're getting all your schedule and everything. And in fact, if you click on schedule, you'll see an option for on demand. And that's where the session recordings will be available to to watch again or recommend to your fellow attendees. Um, And then eventually they will be uploaded um, to YouTube, I believe, um, after the conference is over. 
Um, I may just add briefly, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of this online textbook. I've been using a version of it in my music theory classes since 2014. Um, and I've been using this one since somewhere between last year and this year. <laughs> We've transitioned into it. But um, I also want to really highlight here at the end that the, the whole point of this presentation isn't really about whether this particular textbook works for anybody or whether it you know, helps our field, which I think it does, um, but really about, I think the key insight I'm hoping to get, it, that we're hoping to get across is, is this was a stronger proposal and a, has a stronger impact and stronger reach um, because we're all spread out, we're all from different places and we all know, we all have different sets of people we know and different sets of conferences we go to. For example, I go to the College Music Society conferences pretty frequently. Not a lot of musicians, not not a lot, not all of the academic musicians do that because it includes all sub disciplines within music. So you get flute players talking to music theorists, talking to performers, talking to administrators, as opposed to the sub discipline specific conferences. But not many of my colleagues go to CMS. So we're able to present there because I do that. Etc. Um, I don't know exactly where I'm going with this rambling po point, other than um, you know that that the fact that we're at multiple institutions and we have multiple perspectives and networks, I think, has really strengthened um, this. And so, again, I want to repeat my call to action toward the end of if you're if you're a Scalcom librarian or a provost or a, a library system director, and you have impact on how your OER grant funding works, um, or or your TMP policies. I hope that you'll consider taking a look at those and seeing number one, does it support writing, you know, authoring educational materials, but also does it support auth authoring open educational materials in a way that's open to just, you know, that one faculty member doing that uh, one textbook for my class, right? You can have much more impact if, all, you know, 17 different schools all share the same new history textbook, for example. And yeah, Jeff has a good point. There's a session at 2 p.m. today about tenure and promotion policies. So go to that. We're getting close to the end of time, but there is a little bit more uh, time for questions. If anybody else would like to ask anything. I might just ask a question either by a, a chat or unmute yourself if you want uh, of, is there anyone who in your respective roles on your campuses or organizations has been part of or helped facilitate a, a project that was authored at multiple locations? Uh, is this something that others have, have been part of? Um, and do, do these suggestions track with kind of your experience or? Absolutely, it sounds very familiar. Um, Instead of a Trello board, we had uh, a very big shared Excel sheet with uh, multiple tabs as we had a nine textbook project for um, an organizational behavior track. Uh, so the ed we had what we found out was that even though we had a university press that was working with instructional designers and those instructional designers were working with authors across these courses uh, to author new textbooks in all of these courses, um, getting an editor in chief alongside them and someone who is one of the authors who can help kind of unify the, the tone, the voice, um, get everybody to meet and agree on particular things about, about the subject material, that really helped us out. Once there were editors in chief uh, selected, things moved along much more smoothly. I think I'll jump in just right now because we are at time to stop the recording. However, I'm not going to close the room. So y'all are welcome to continue your conversation. 